Welcome to the Star of Ryan. Please join me in welcoming our friend, Peter Harrison. How's it going, Peter? Very great. Thank you, Brian. How are you? Good, good. Uh, so thank you for uh, coming out here. Wow, you know, great news today. You went... Uh, was it yesterday or is this today, right? Yeah, no, today. You went today. shopping, right? We, we went shopping. You bought, you bought a, a startup. <laughs> very, very excited. Uh, company uh, called People Matter. Yeah. Which is perfect for us because people matter at Snag a Job. Uh, so uh, just we couldn't be more excited. Uh, great company, great product, great people, and just a great market fit. We'll definitely talk more about that, but I just wanted to say yeah. congratulations because it's a Thank nice. Uh, <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> It's DC Tech, we rock. All right, so, so we always like to start uh, from the beginning. Where were you born? Where were you raised? Perhaps uh, what did your parents do? And maybe talk about your first entrepreneur experience as a child. So let's start with you. Yeah, so I grew up in, in London, England. Um, my my uh, father was a, was a, a banker, uh, not, not a Wall Street banker, sort of a more... Main Street banker, but uh, but you know very middle class family I would say, and and um, and yet uh, you know I from a very early age sort of fell in love with with two things I fell in love with computers and I fell in love with 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 America. Some crazy reason I got introduced and and traveled here when I was thirteen and uh, just fell in love with with this country, and so uh, you know I knew. Uh, from first sight, really, that this was the place I wanted to come. So, do you have a uh, first entrepreneur experience? Yes. Yeah, okay. So let's hear my, about that. My, well, my first experience is not a uh, not a, a very uh, uh, unusual one. It was a it was a paper route, um, you know, and and certainly in those days, it was you know you kind of you fought for every street you got to cover. Uh, so that was a little bit of entre entrepreneurialness, but but uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of. Uh, you know, fun, just just uh, you know, making your first uh, your first cash. Uh, so uh, so I did a little bit of research, and you know, there's a whole backstory uh, when you were younger. You said that um, growing up in UK, that the culture there in the '80s was about having a comfortable job, right? It's very, it's all about getting that job, not don't shake you, the boat. You, you worked yeah. to live. Work to live, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, your first. Job, which uh, this is ties really in with what you're doing now, but um, maybe the second job because you was a paper route. Maybe your second job was an hourly worker cleaning Lon uh, streets in London. Yes, street yeah, cleaner. Yeah. Is that right? It wasn't as entrepreneurial. I was working for the government, <laughs> Got it. Uh, but uh, but it paid well, uh, and I found that uh, that you know actually what was nice about it is you really got paid to complete the job. So what was supposed to be eight hours, I could pretty much finish off in two or three. So it worked out to be it's a good like hourly It's like six rate. hours later. Yeah. <laughs> um, so has your humble beginnings, um, you know, given you a perspective uh, of becoming, especially your world-class business leader, has it given, what kind of perspective has it given you? Yeah, I think it just, it does just keep you humble. I, I at the end of the day, recognize I'm really no different from anyone else. And, and um, you know, I think, uh, just helps keep me grounded. By the way, uh, please tweet out because there's going to be some major. You're going to there's some major uh, nuggets you're going to be dropping here, right? It's going to be some amazing. There, there's this story is <laughs> amazing. Um, hashtag startup grind at PCJ Harrison. Okay, start tweeting out, guys. So let's go first. Start out with uh, your first company. Because everyone's like, oh, Snag a Job, who cares? Blah, blah, blah. And then what about the other three companies? Well, whatever. Yeah. Sear, Sear Technology, your first company, yeah. okay? I don't know how old you were, maybe straight out of college, maybe mid-20s here. Um, started in 1990. Uh, Co-founder, you are VP of sales of Sear Technology. You grew this company in five years from zero revenue to $120 million. The last speaker that we had who did that was Joe Payne, and he sold his company for a billion to Oracle. So, like, 
What is and we, the and we did that in the early 90s. You did so that in the early 90s those without the internet. Those are 90s dollars. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is crazy. Like, like what? And then eventually this company went IPO, right, in 1995. What? Tell, like, I want to hear the story. Like, <laughs> what, what, what was it? And, you know, like, how did you get this to $120 million? Well, so uh, so we, we were an enterprise software company. Um, it did help that our customers were very, very large. Uh, we had customers that would spend you know, five to $10 million on the software, so you didn't need too many of those to get to $120 million. Um, but uh, it was really a very exciting journey. And I'd say that the, probably the, the key to our success there was very early on getting a partnership with IBM and having them be a big part of our go-to-market. So it gave us, we had the, the technology of a startup, but with the, with the go-to-market of a giant. So it's interesting because the, same, the principles sort of apply even today. I mean, uh, at the AOL Fishbowl Labs, like we're always saying partnership or perish. And it's funny how, you know, 30, 40 Doesn't years, change. 30 years is still <laughs> the same, right? Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, after that, I mean, which you could have just retired, but then, uh, then you created another company, uh, Versa Versata, mm -hmm. um, and then that, that you grew in four years, 100, uh, 1 million to 56 million. Not as, not as great as the first one, <laughs> but um, you, you got to raise $70 million uh, and then IPO that company, and this is in year 2000, right? Um, <clears throat> and, and then I'll just, because I'll, I'll describe it, then the, there's, a, there's a question here. So uh, the IPO became one of the best, uh, 25 best openings of all time with $4 billion. Uh, how is the dot-com error different than the sort of valuations you see right now? Is, do you see a difference? Well, so we were valued at 100 times revenues on the day of the IPO, so I think we're not quite there yet. <laughs> um, I think what was different then is there, there were companies going public there, and uh, you know that really didn't in many in some cases didn't even have revenues, right? And 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 so it was a different time. I, I think we definitely uh, are seeing um, you know some uh, exuberism, some some excitement here, but but not not I don't think in the same league. And certainly when you look at the revenue multiples, not the same. Probably st still seeing a lot of companies where you know the Profit isn't, you know, being uh, held in such high regard, but 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 at least these companies are, are are have revenues and are growing fast. So we should be less worried today than say <laughs> a little, the, a little, little less. less? Okay, okay, <laughs> um, okay. And then uh, and then the third story, which is the uh, Global Logic. In fact, Global Logic was here in McLean. Um, you became one of the largest product outsourcing companies in the world, born in 2001, downturn, right? So like after the, the dot bomb, you decided to create another startup, right? Like, why? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, like, tell us that story. I mean, that's, that's got to be crazy. Well, uh, the resilience to look past that and this, do, create another startup. Yeah, so, so uh, you know, I, I, I would say, uh, you know, in part, I needed the money. I I, uh, I I I was worth an awful lot on paper at one point, but uh, you know, IPOs uh, aren't always all all they're cracked up to be. Uh, but I'd say, you know, more seriously, I I think uh, you know, I I love growing and building things, and and the opportunity to work with uh, this unique group of people and build something great just was too exciting. And I'd say, you know, I think uh, seeding a company in a really tough environment is a, is, is, is a great time to, to grow. It's like, uh, it's like a fine wine, isn't it? You know, the tougher the soil, the, 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 the better the, the crop. So I think, uh, I think actually having, that, having to overcome that adversity meant we really had to have something great. So what's really interesting is that like it's it was probably winter wonderland then like nobody wanted to invest anything in 2001 you man in 2002 you were appointed as CEO of, of Global Logic uh you you managed to get money from NEA and Sequoia this is one of the they were the best they're the best now they're the best they were the best then as well um how did you pull that off i mean what was sort of the metrics that you had that eventually convinced an NEA to invest in you. 
Yeah. Well, so so we certainly were very fortunate to get them as investors, both both really blue chip uh, companies and investors. But uh, we didn't do it in 2002. Uh, I, I, it took four years to sort of get the company to to a place where we could attract them. Frankly, uh, it took four years of growing the company, but it took at least two or three years of cultivating a relationship with them and building our credibility with them so that when we were ready for money, they were ready to write the check. We weren't a surprise to them. So I think that was really important, to having the metrics, but also having time to build and cultivate a relationship with them and giving them regular updates on your progress uh, was so, really key. Same sort of success, uh, uh, secret formula, having those essential, crucial partnerships, right? Yes, so you said yes. Yes, Fortune 500 companies, yeah. and that hey, we, these and are our clients. Gives you a little bit more credibility, obviously. Right? Yeah, and and uh, you could say also with acquisitions, I'd say you know the most successful acquisitions we've done have been ones where we've cultivated a relationship a uh, long time in advance. And now that that company again, when you started, it was 20 employees to 8,000 employees today with a quarter of a billion dollars. Uh, so my next question is. Um, why did you leave this company for Snag a Job? So this is the Snag a Job story. Like, why did you? Yeah. Why did so, you leave? So, so I was there ten years, and that was a good, uh, good chunk of time. And I had uh, learned a lot, and 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 loved it. The travel did, I have to say, wear a little. Uh, we ended up with, with uh, you know, design studios and innovation hubs in fifteen cities, and and uh, and that took its toll on me. I, I, I um. In my last year at Global Logic, we hired 2,000 people. We must have interviewed 10,000 people. And I was so frustrated with the lack of, of science to that. It was so thoroughly ad hoc, uh, the whole process by which we would, we would identify people and then uh, ultimately select people. And uh, so I was really, really primed for the opportunity at Snag a Job when I was first introduced to the company as a company that really is trying to apply science and big data to the, the, the business and the challenge of matching. I was really, really primed for that opportunity. So in, uh, if you can fit this in a tweet, what is Snagit Jobs? <laughs> Because uh, I mean, I'm sure they know, but I just just for the purpose of the video. Yeah, we're the largest marketplace for our hourly workers in, in the U.S. We've 70 million members. We've got 250,000 employers, um, and uh, we have one in two people looking for lightly skilled hourly work in the U.S. today are using our product. So typical clients would be uh, like a Marriott, like these ho like hotel and hotels, r retail, retail restaurants, a very substantial number. We work with fifty of the top fifty restaurant chains in the country. Um, so hashtag startup grind at PCJ Harrison. Um, so what you know the skills that you had learned in gl global logic. Um, how has that been applicable to your role as the CEO for Snag a Job? Um, one one thing we had talked about in the, in the back was, you know, you had led uh, three startups that was founder that was founder led, and now you are transplanted into a company as sort of this hired CEO. You've seen both sides of the, of the table. You know, what 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 do you see? Like, what, is is it is there a difference? Yeah. Um, is it better? Is it worse? <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, it's a very different experience entirely coming into a business that's a you know a going concern has hundreds of people um, versus starting something from scratch. It's it's quite different. And and I was uh, giving you the example and probably like uh, you know having a baby versus versus adopting. Uh, so you know definitely pros and cons, uh, but really a a, a fascinating uh, uh, experience because. This is a company that had great, great roots, great culture, and uh, and great, uh, great uh, mission, great purpose, um, but but really had um, had gone in too many different directions, had tried to go and, and and solve too many problems. So really, my first order of business was was helping really get the company focused and refocusing, deciding what we were going to do, deciding more importantly what we weren't going to do. And and putting it on uh, on a more focused track, and that's really uh, and that combined with having such great roots, I think, has been really what has propelled the success. Um, 
So you managed to raise a hundred million dollars at the beginning of this year. This is, uh, I think, that would be the second biggest raise here in D.C. in the last, I don't know, I'd say a couple of years. I know uh, Tenable Network Security, they're the 250 million, but a um, you know, hundred million dollars, that's, I mean, that's not something to be like, oh, <laughs> that's a lot of money. And so, like, what's your secret? <laughs> Dogged persistence. <laughs> uh, we must have talked to almost a hundred different uh, investment groups through the process, and uh, so just a lot of meetings and a lot of persistence. And uh, you know, I think the whole the process probably took me about a year end to end. So you know, it was not a you know it was not an overnight sensation, but uh, but persistence and finding the right uh, the right syndicate, the right group. Um, I'd say persistence. Persistence is is the critical critical ingredient in I think any entrepreneur, right? I was hoping like another. <laughs> I mean, I mean, so I mean, you know, you had to foster some of the relationships. I yeah. mean I mean, I mean, hundred million dollars is a lot of money. I mean, <laughs> like, there's got to be more than that. Like, I mean, persistence. I understand, but I mean. Well, so I, look, it does help. You know, it helps when you have a track record. Yeah. So you you've been okay. able to show you know good returns in the past. That gives a certain amount of credibility. Um, I think it helps to have you know good good metrics. Um, that, so uh, like what were sort of the metrics? That well, so that that I think the two two most critical metrics, uh, and they're probably you know two of the most critical metrics for any startup. Uh, it's the, it, the 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 cost to acquire. And the lifetime value, how much costs you fully loaded to acquire a customer, and the lifetime value of that customer from 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 the very first dollar to the very last, and expressing. So you knew that like the back of your hand, obviously, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, that's that's very crucial. Absolutely crucial. Yeah, and showing the the, the ratio of those two, and showing the trends, and how those trends are. What's changing. a good ratio? Would you say you, you you have to be north of three? Uh, you want uh, three at least three times the the value, and this is not the revenue. This is value. So you have to you actually have to have your. It's really more think of it as gross margin. Um, but you look at the how much gross margin you can produce over the course of the life of a customer, and and then think of that as an expression of of how much it costs to acquire that customer in the first place. And um, you know, three. You know, it needs to be at least three x. I think to 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 be a reasonable business. Um. D uh, so, do you guys look at CAC ratio? Yes. Okay. So let's <laughs> talk about that. Though no, I had a conversation with with well, Joe Payne about CAC, that. CAC uh, yeah. cost to acquire is the CAC ratio. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, is there any maybe insights you can give us, like what numbers to look for? So CAC. Uh, so CAC ratio is the. Um, the gross margin divided by quarter divided by the sales and marketing. Yeah, so it's it's literally the ratio between cost to acquire yep. and lifetime value. Yep. So okay. You, you, so over you, three. You take the lifetime value and you divide it by the cost to acquire, and that gives you a number. And so anything over three. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, some of the startups, um, I think the Bessemer website had said, hey, if you're under one. Um, I think it was point three or something. Then you need to you need to change your marketing. Uh, so that would be it. expressing the ratio the other yep. way around, right. right? So if you put lifetime value at the bottom and CAC on the top, and and a lot of these SaaS metrics and and and, and startup metrics, it, people have slightly different ways they right. slice and dice them. But it's fundamentally it's the ratio between and and really what it says is you don't ultimately want to be spending more than about 20 to 25 percent of your total revenue on sales and marketing right that's really the fundamental where you where you want to get to the ratio helps you figure out you know if you're headed in that direction or not because if you're spending more than about 25 percent on sales and marketing then you're just working too hard Duly noted. I hope you guys are tw tweeting that out. That's pretty good. Because Joe Payne, when I when I asked him, I was like, I still didn't understand. I was, you, you put it away. I was like, oh, twenty percent. Got it. Right. Uh, so let's talk about. Um, you open up another office here in D.C. You uh, snag a job, and I'm not sure if this was bef before they had appointed you, but uh, this company originally came from Richmond. They're near Richmond. That's right. Yeah. And why did they 
decide to, because when I've been doing, when I've been doing some reading, it's like, oh, DC company, it's DC company, right? DC, right? right? Yeah, and I'm sure Richmond's pretty pissed off about <laughs> that, right? <laughs> right, like it's Richmond, it's like DC. Um, so Richmond was a great, great yeah. place to get started, okay. uh, and and you know, really, it gave us a gave us the ability to very quickly be big and meaningful and impactful. We are today by far and away the hottest, coolest startup in Richmond and have been for, for almost a decade. Um, and, and so we, it allows us to get the very, very best people that Richmond has. But that works only to a point. And then you get to a point where, where you need certain skills that you actually can't get in Richmond anymore. Uh, or, or could never get in Richmond, don't exist. Or you need a certain number of people with those skills that, that, that doesn't exist. So, so we had to, at some point, uh, grow, grow beyond Richmond. That doesn't mean to say we aren't in Richmond. We are. We, we, we are still growing our team there, and, and they're great. But we, we, had to, we had to be able to tap into a bigger uh, labor force and, and talent pool. And, and, and so DC was just a natural evolution. So this is what a lot of people are going to appreciate this question, but Richmond, you could have skipped DC to go to New York, <laughs> right? You could have. I mean, you could have said we're sure. a New York company. Why? Well, why do you pick DC? Uh, okay, so so I I, I live in DC. <laughs> <laughs> very, Besides that, very simple, very simple. I live a few blocks from here, and right. and this is my hometown, and or it is now my adopted hometown, and so, uh, the the you know, my, look, the the board recruited me, and 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 I said, you know, I'm not going to Richmond, but I'd be fine, you know, building and growing a presence here. I think, uh, I think DC is a fantastic market too. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit like Richmond in that it's, you know, it's obviously not as, as, as tier one, uh, but, but it also has a fantastic, it probably got 10 times the size of tech community and, uh, you know, therefore a much larger, more vibrant talent pool, but still not quite as frothy and as, 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 as turbulent as, as maybe uh, you know the Silicon Valley or New York. So this is going to be my next question about talent acquisition. Um, you know, one of the biggest challenge in the tech industry is obviously um, you know acquiring the best. Um, if you are in Silicon Valley, you know you can uh, you know you can acquire talent that's pretty top notch. Uh, if you are on the East Coast. Maybe less. I mean, what's your opinion about that? So the whole talent acquisition, East Coast, yeah, West yeah, Coast. Yeah, you've done that yeah. before. You've been on both yeah, both sides. Yeah. What is your opinion about it? Is there there's no great doubt, talent here? There's no doubt that well, there is great talent here. Uh, there's no doubt. I I, I um, you know I, I do think one of the challenges this area has, which is both a blessing and a curse, is is the government and 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 there is a massive uh, draw that. You know that government and companies that work for the government put on 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 technology in this area, and so uh, tech startups have to compete. Frankly, with that, they have to compete with 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 you know with those companies who are you know very often comfortable paying a lot more for for a lot less effort, and so that's a challenge. But I think uh, overall, I think we've got a fantastic uh, community here, but. Again, I think you know, similar to the sort of the the, the relationship between Richmond and DC, it it, it isn't uh, it isn't as abundant. Um, and when you come to when you come to very specific, very niche skills, it's hard to find. I mean, for, as an example, we're looking for people right now that have world class understanding of the taxonomy of a job, understanding of the semantics and all of the things that go into, you know, is a, is a, is a barista someone, you know, is a barista, you know, a sandwich artist or, or not, right? And so that kind of knowledge, there's probably only, you know, a thousand people in the country that have that kind of knowledge. And unfortunately, you know, maybe only one or two in DC. So Anybody just... fit that description here in this room? <laughs> raise your hand. If they do, please raise your hand and give me your card at the end. <laughs> but, uh, but, as, uh, but as that example, I mean, we're in, we're in you know, my uh, CTO is in, in California today interviewing data scientists who have exactly that skill. So, so they're going to be cases and in invariably in a company's growth where you're looking for those, those, those jewels, those diamonds, and, and uh, where, you know, it's hard to, to find in, in D.C. 
So, uh, <clears throat> so you just talk about growth. I want to sort of uh, ask a question based on that. So, um, when you're growing, obviously there's going to be a lot of changes internally in the company, and one of the things that people are probably curious of, specifically for Snag of Jobs is how do you maintain culture? Because you know, as, as I'm looking on the website, like you guys have slides, you guys are doing like, you know, a soccer, like office chair. And it's like, man, that looks cool, right? Um, but you know, you, you raised a hundred million dollars. I'm sure that could ruin things um, when it comes to money. So how do you maintain culture? Yeah, yeah. Uh, throughout yeah so, so look uh, in the slides and cool offices i think that's sort of table stakes today uh, this is a cool office there's cool offices everywhere so I, I i think that's not enough it does come ultimately to me down to values and having a great value system and and having that well known and well understood and then actually using those values as you think about recruiting and making sure you're bringing people on board who share those values using those values in how you develop and grow people and ultimately in maybe how you exit people if they don't fit with those values and, and making sure you're relentlessly working on those three things because without that, as a company grows, the natural tendency is for the culture to erode. So it becomes an even bigger job every year to ensure you maintain those. Um, you know, at Global Global Logic, you grew from twenty employees to eight thousand employees, um, and so I mean, obviously, you, have, you took cues from there to, to figure out what how you can apply that to Snaga Jobs. Um, you have this thing called Culture Squad, right? That's Never right. Read about yeah. it. What, what is that? Yeah. What's, yeah, a, so, what's your Culture Squad? So you what know, a that? lot of companies give culture to HR. They say HR is responsible for establishing and enforcing the culture or, or reinforcing the culture. And uh, we, we have a different view. Um, you know, we, first of all, we don't actually have HR in our company. We have a group called Snagger Services. Their job is to, to, to help people, uh, to help uh, the snaggers in our case. Um, but the culture is the responsibility of the culture squad. And the culture squad is a sort of self-elected volunteer group cross, uh, cross organizational, cross departmental. We have uh, one in each office. And uh, you meet on a regular basis, the people who are passionate about driving and, and reinforcing the culture and, and growing it. And, and, and I think that's the way, the right way, because then you ensure it's really a grassroots thing. It's not something sort of driven by management from above, but it's really a grassroots thing that everyone is, is excited about and passionate about and, and, and driving themselves. So uh, what, what's, what's up? I mean, so, you know, the Zappos guys, you know, they are all about culture. And, you know, one of their tenants is like, you know, uh, embrace the weirdness. Do you guys have, I mean, what's the most quirky thing you guys done at Snag a Job? <laughs> well, we do a lot of quirky things, yeah. uh, a lot of quirky things. I, I think probably the thing we're most celebrated for is is, uh, is our chair soccer. Uh, it's a sport that, uh, that we... Uh, we uh, innovated a, a few years back, and in fact, if you just Google square, you know, chair soccer or snag a job, you'll, you'll, you'll see uh, uh, an example of it. But you're, you're, you're essentially strapped to an office chair on wheels, uh, kicking, kicking balls. You can't get up off the chair. Five-a-side team, indoor soccer. It's a lot of fun. It can get a little dangerous, uh, but it's an awful lot of fun. Um. Uh, so if you guys like Google, I mean, it's, f it's funny you say that because when I, when I Googled Snag a Job and I click images, I'm not even kidding you, the first image is like a guy on a, on a chair like kicking a soccer. So like before the Snag a Job. You didn't have I, to put in chair right. soccer. I just, I just, like, you didn't have to do that. It was, that was like the first picture and then your Snag a Job logo. <laughs> so I'm sure it was very popular. And so um, so back, back to the whole, like, again, the, you know, that you're scaling up, right? I mean... <clears throat> Growing 1 million users every 35 days, I'm sure there are some challenges organizationally and technically. Can you talk about them? Like, what are some of the challenges and what are you doing to solve it? Yeah. Especially when you're scaling. Yeah. So, so you know, the, the, the um, example is often given, right? It's like uh, like flying a jet but having to do maintenance on it uh, as you go. And, and, and that's true. With a startup, you're constantly having to to do work on the vehicle that's propelling you forward. And 
So that takes uh, a lot of work. It also takes comfort with uh, things breaking. Um, you know, anytime you're growing fast as a company, you have to accept a little bit of breakage. The trick is making sure that not too many things are breaking. Um, you know, if, if, if everything's great, then you're almost certainly not growing fast enough. Uh, if too much is breaking, then, you know, then it really can undermine your opportunity for future growth and, and you don't have the right foundation. So getting the right mix and getting the right balance of investment in, in what you need to keep things going today, what you need to prepare for tomorrow, and then, and then thinking you know, about next year and the year after. So, I mean, we always ask all the, all the speakers about this. What is the biggest challenge right now going forward at Snagger Jobs? I mean, we did, there's a lot of successes, but what do you think is the biggest challenge yeah. right now? And, um, and, um, and then the other question is I'm going to ask you, like, what, is, what has been your biggest challenge? Yeah. Um, and how did you resolve it? Like, yeah, so, so, you know, to me, every time challenge uh, means opportunity, and, and certainly the biggest opportunity we have at Snagger Job today is, is uh, really embracing the on-demand economy. Uh, it's an opportunity a lot of companies have today. Um, we, are, we just launched a new product uh, called Snagger Shift, um, which is uh, our first foray into starting to blur the line between the job and the shift. So we have an app that helps you open the app, get hired, and now the app helps you, having got hired, go pick a shift, swap a shift, change shifts. And, um, and so I blurring that line, that's something that the market is going to do. We have to be out in front of it. And, and, and yet that's a bit like the whole surfing challenge. You don't want to be too far out of the wave. You don't want to be too high and too too far behind. You have to just time it just right. So are you looking at like um sharing economy startups or gig economy? Senator Warner loves that term yeah, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Um the well, gig economy startups well, like are you guys looking we, into we absolutely uh, are and 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 they represent both our greatest threat but also our greatest opportunity because we we have the benefit already of of 10 million monthly unique visitors and we have you know hundreds of thousands of employees we already have a fantastic network many of them would like to avail themselves of on demand they would like to be able to get someone quickly, uh, maybe tonight, right? I need another bartender, I need another uh, 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 dishwasher, whatever. And, and so the, so the uh, opportunity for us is to build that on our platform. Uh, uh, sort of think of it as just another app in our app store. We have a platform, our app store, and then this is another app. Which is which is really interesting because, like in the traditional sense of the um, categorization of workers, you have the W two and ten ninety nines, and now there's this third category of this on demand worker. And how do you account for you know the uh, the benefits yeah. and you know yeah. that it, from a traditional sense yeah. from a W two? Are you guys like in the forefront of that? Like, I think so. I mean, there is a unique opportunity right now, and and in fact, you know, very often startups respond to you know regulations uh you know with with the 30 hour uh, threshold for for healthcare uh we have a lot of workers who'd like to work more and a lot of employers who would like them to work less and that creates a unique opportunity for us as an intermediary to help a worker who needs to work 40 or more hours a week but is unavailable unable to get that at just one employer. So, so we get to play the middleman and piece together 20 hours here and 20 hours there and help them manage and coordinate their shifts across multiple employers. Are there any startups here that, are, um, that address like the on-demand economy, gig economy? Anyone here? Okay. Surprise. So, so actually, so I wanted to ask about, you know, when you acquired People matter. So this is more of the the acquiring yeah. companies. Like what sort of companies? I mean, you you. So my uh, this is a two prime question yeah. here. Uh, what did you see in People Matter? Uh, what sort of um, opportunities do you see in this acquisition? And then what are other acquisitions you guys are looking at? Because you have hundred million dollars. Yeah. 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 So, so let's. So I think you know acquisitions uh, are typically done for three reasons. Uh, they, they, you know people product customers um 
I, I could probably add a fourth, which is sort of the marketplace dynamic. You know, sometimes you buy companies just to keep them out of the competitors' hands, but 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 mostly it's those first three, and it's some mix of those first three. In some cases, it's mostly one of those and a little bit of of the others. In our case, People Matter was really all three. We 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 loved the people, thought they had really a great team. Uh, we loved the product. Really, they have a world class product. Uh, that that fit very very nicely with ours, and we love their customers. And and actually, you know, all three of those were in play. Um, the customers was just super compelling. Uh, you know, particularly combined with the product, because we knew that day one we could take our product and sell it to their customers, and we could take <laughs> their product and sell it to our customers. And that on its own really justified the deal. Everything else was really gravy. And and we expect a lot of other things, but that on its own, was was we justified the math. And so, what other technologies and acquisition potentials are you guys looking at? Like, is there? Because <laughs> you're here, uh, you're here, you're speaking in front of a room full of startups yeah, and innovators. So, so so look, we're we're constantly on the lookout and will be. Uh, one of the things I learned at my second startup was, it's no good growing really really fast if the market's growing faster than you. So at Versada, we grew 400% year over year for three years, but the market was growing faster. And so you can't be too purist, especially if you're working in a very tight window where you know the market is moving quickly, where it doesn't afford you the time to you know, take the year or two years that are required to build out that offering. So, so I think uh, you know, looking for companies really fundamentally that accelerate our roadmap. So uh, just on top of that, what you just said, so if, if a market segment, I don't know, let's call it mobile ad or something, mm -hmm. growing by 50% and then your revenues, you see it growing 30%. Is that a not good example? Good. You're like, uh, not good. <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're ultimately that wave is going to crush you. Yeah. Because you're, a, you're getting every year to be a smaller percentage of that market, not a bigger percentage. Yeah. So beat the market. Beat the market. <laughs> beat the market, guys. Hashtag startup grind at PCJ Harrison. What is the future of Snagit Jobs? What do you see Snagit Jobs in five years? Yeah, so maybe so, an IPO. <laughs> so actually, you know, that 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 that's simple. I think we 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 have an opportunity to be Uber for everything else. Uh, Uber is uh, is you know giving drivers the opportunity to pick up driving work at their their convenience, giving them the freedom. We get to do that for restaurant, retail, and hospitality, and essentially allow people to pick up pick up shifts, pick up jobs, pick up work uh, across those. Uh, pick it up get the shift, check in, check out, get paid, just make that whole loop seamless and near instant from the phone. So, so I think that's a giant, giant opportunity. Um, I, I think that uh, that will, uh, we, we'll, grow, we'll grow to a big company uh, even without that, but I think that's what makes us a really huge company, a really important company. So I mean, uh, before we had you here, um, uh, I, I had talked about Snag a Job like a couple months ago. I was like, "This is going to be the next Living Social here in this in this area, <laughs> oh, even goodness, better I actually." <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, okay, in a good way, in a good way, in a good way. I'm sorry, in a good way. Like what Living Social should have been. So much right? better. <laughs> so much better. So no, no, this is amazing yes, because no, Living Social is a great company. I don't want to to sound bad, but uh, you know, I think I think the key. For, the key, I, I've always felt the key is building for the long haul, building a business that, 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 can, uh, that can scale. And, and that, to me, involves sort of always looking around the corner a little bit, always anticipating what the market's going to do next. Not too far around the corner, but a little bit around the corner. So it goes back to your question earlier about, you know, how do you, how do you keep growing? And, and, and I think, you know, having the right mix of, of investment between what you need to be doing today, what you want to do for tomorrow, and then what you want to do for, for, for the future. I'm just hoping, when, when are you guys going to be labeled as the unicorn? Yeah. <laughs> Less than a year? Because, I mean, there's a lot of people that, that, that are kicking themselves like, man, I should have found a way to work at Uber or yeah, Lyft. Yeah. And now they have a chance. Uh, to... uh, we, 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 yeah, so, so uh, you know, I think we have a giant, giant opportunity. I think uh, we're, 
you know, solving a very big problem and really disrupting uh, an interesting space. Um, you know, whether whether you do that as a unicorn or whether you do that as a public company, um, uh, you know, I think only the mar only the public markets will determine. But I have no doubt that we will we will surpass that number. So what kind of positions are you guys hiring? Like, what do you guys have open? What are you looking yeah, for right now? Yeah, so this is why we're, we're here. Look, so, what, so we're hiring across the board. Um, and, you know, for those people who are passionate entrepreneurs, we love passionate entrepreneurs. So uh, we're hiring in sales and marketing and, and product and engineering and design and, uh, and finance and, and, and service. So really across the board. And that is that primarily here in D.C. or Richmond? It's going to be here. Uh, primarily in in those two, uh, but now with with Charleston, we'll be hiring in Charleston, and we actually just opened uh, uh, an office in in the Bay Area in Berkeley, so uh, starting to so so our seed there, and 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 we'll be hiring there as well. Do anybody here fit that? Description like what he's looking for. Raise your hands. Okay, I'm yeah, well, just gonna get you guys excited here. You know? so now's your chance, right? It's a, the next Uber. It's all um, about having a great team. <laughs> um, so before I open up for questions, um, is there any questions I didn't ask you? You wish I asked you. <laughs> Well, uh, <laughs> you asked me that earlier, and I did right. give you kind of, I think, the one nugget, uh, which to me is the, 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 real, the real trick to, to being an entrepreneur is knowing how quickly to focus and then how quickly to, to, to expand. And so, uh, like every startup, I think, has to go through this dilemma of how quickly you converge on the one thing that you're going to do that's truly world class and, and w for which there is a great market for. And then, and then be very thoughtful about how and when you decide to, to solve other problems or to try and take, take, take your product to other markets. So, uh, I think that to me is the central. Uh, uh, challenge and, and strategic conundrum of any of any entrepreneur and any startup, but otherwise, I'd say you know I go back to my persistence, persistence, and, and build the best possible team you can. Uh, the the raw ingredients of any great company. Okay, great. We're going to open up the floor to Q and A. So before I do, um, who are the? Do we have any um, City Pass members or VIP that want? Do we have to have any questions? Here we go. Hi, Peter. Sure. Um, tell me what you think about moonlighting. They're in um, Charlottesville and kind of in your space. Where, where do you see them fitting? Yes, yes. So we know moonlighting. And uh, like, like the business uh, a lot, um, th they're a little bit more focused. So moonlighting is, a, is a, a startup focused on helping people, as the name suggests, maybe find, find, uh, find jobs aside from your day job <laughs> um they they tend to be a little more focused on skilled jobs uh the knowledge worker type jobs uh, that maybe you can do from home or do remotely uh we focus really substantially on jobs that you would go somewhere and and really more focused on sort of the lightly skilled so think uh you know waiter waitress uh you know crew uh you know um uh, retail cashier, th those kinds of jobs where typically you're going to to a to a place. So, a slightly different kind of job, um, but 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 an uh, an equally interesting puzzle to solve. Okay, next question. Good evening. My name is Nick. I have a question regarding this new initiative called Snagash, called Snagashift here. As you're because as you're striving to become the Uber for everything else. I understand that you know in retail and restaurant and those type of mark those type of industries and stores they even though there are the job there isn't as complex as astrophysics they still have operational and procedural differences what is Snagashift's uh, mitigation plan on minimizing those learning curves yeah. so for people to hop around those different type of positions yeah great great question so so the first way we are doing it is we're helping people hop around within a brand so if you've worked at a subway, then you should really be able to go work at any subway. Now, today, because of the franchisee model, they're completely different employers. 
Uh, but we can, we because we know your credentials, because we we have your endorsements, we can help market you to other, and allow other subways franchisees to pick you up. So that so those skills can be really kind of plug and play, and and are somewhat commoditized. Once you're a sandwich artist at Subway, you're a sandwich artist at any Subway. Um, so then it's not a small, it's not, it's only a small hop to go from there to to. Um, you know, to another a subs joint, and and you know, if you have built up a good enough reputation, you've got enough stars, you've got enough uh, thumbs up, uh, you've 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 proved you you you're punctual, and you show up when you when you need to. You got a little video clip that talks about who you are. You've got a personality test on your profile. You've got your work experience. That's a lot of information for an employer. They get to make a very informed decision in a very short space of time about you. And, and, and so we're giving them more and more data that can help them make that decision uh, in real time. So, so uh, it's, it's, it's happening in a small way. I think uh, think of it initially as, as, as kind of more sharing economy, you know, uh, franchisees sharing workers across, across franchises. Uh, but but from there, it's it's only a small hop to 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 think across brands as well, especially related brands. Okay, next question. Yeah, uh, Peter, um, can you see me? Did you look in this? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just I just thinking. I like your style. It's kind of laid back in the California <laughs> thing. I was thinking that maybe that's the reason that's why you're able to raise a hundred million dollars because you go, you go into those meetings laid back with your with no tie and people think he's confident <laughs> and all that stuff. We'll give him the money. Which leads me to my next question. There's always this glossing over from Apple to Microsoft. There's a glossing over about the initial stages, the magic initial stages of how money actually gets raised. We hear all the stuff about jobs in Wozniak building the Apple and the garages and all that stuff. I go back 26 years to your first company because they say the first $10 million is the most difficult to actually raise. So I'm not really interested in snag a job and all that stuff. I want to go back to your first company, which is before the, the, the web. How much of that money was yours? I know you sold to some great enterprise software, you said. But how much money of yours did you get from your, your own pocket, from your family and friends? How much of that? Because that's a story that's never told. Yes. How much skin did you have in the game? <laughs> OK, well, I feel like such an imposter when you ask me that question, because I have never used my own money. And I, I feel immense self, sense of guilt whenever I talk to entrepreneurs who are, you know, shoe strapping and credit cards and going around with a cap and friends and family. I've never done that. Um, I, I have always managed to persuade somebody else <laughs> uh, to put up the money and, and actually another entity to put up the money, uh, which I think is better than an individual because you, you kind of, if it doesn't work out, you don't feel quite as much guilt. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so in that sense, I am not that kind of entrepreneur. Um, I'm a different kind, I guess. But uh, yeah, yeah. How did I raise it? So, so you know, I think good, good, good fortune and a good team. A group of us who had worked together uh, all decided to 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 leave. Uh, about uh, about six or seven of us, just sort of together, decided we'd love to go start something. And um, we did Moonlight, uh, and we did a little work, uh, you know, behind, uh, you know, after hours, and and uh, got sort of a little of the nucleus of that, and then used that to to go out and get uh, an investor interested. So Peter, I totally forgot, but oh, me over here, over here. <laughs> um, you, do you do angel investing? Yes, I do. You do. Yes, okay. Yeah. What what kind of companies do you? So uh, actually, I, I I'm part of a, a network uh, called Blue Ventures, B L U. Yep. So uh, a great great group uh, that uh, that do uh, early stage investing. Okay. Uh, I, I I like to focus on 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 software technology enabled services. I, I really like the intersection of technology and service, which by the way I think of as different as from SaaS. SaaS is really just software sitting in the cloud. Uh, Technology-enabled service is a service rendered through software, and I think there's an important distinction there. But I'm very excited about investing in early-stage technology-enabled services businesses. So I just recently joined a startup real-time. These are my coworkers, so I'm going to give him <laughs> the mic to ask you a question. So here we go, Frank. Hey, thank you so much. Really enjoying the discussion. Uh, I'm curious about Snagajobs. Um, 
it seems to me like you're disrupting the job search market from the low end by targeting a market of low skilled jobs. And um, do you see yourself on a trajectory, I'm curious, to eventually move up and eventually be saying, well, an investment banker at Goldman is just like an investment banker at Citi, and so you can, you know, are you on that trajectory to eventually take over the, the whole job market? Yeah, um, gr great question. And, and um, I have to say, you know, like you, when I first came, I thought the low end of the market and, uh, and maybe it's not that interesting, but as I learned more about it, I have become fascinated by this market. First of all, it's the it's the lifeblood of of, of the American economy. It's uh, there's 70 million people doing hourly jobs in America today. 45 million of them that are lightly skilled hourly workers. So it's really the bedrock of the American economy. It's a huge number. Uh, by the way, because they turn over jobs so quickly, 80% of all hires made each year are hourly, 80% of all hires made each year are into hourly jobs. So it's a giant share, it's a giant market. It's a giant market in the US, it's a giant market globally. So, so truthfully, I don't believe we have to go outside of hourly. And I think by just being world class at hourly, really understanding why hourly jobs are different, how they're different, uh, you know, I think really gives us an opportunity to build a really big and exciting business. And they're hiring. <laughs> can we get can we get a job through Snagger Jobs to work at Snagger Jobs? <laughs> no, because it's not an hourly job. Oh. Well, I could but be a janitor. Can get a job I could be a janitor. janitor. You, know, you could get a side job. Okay. I'll be a referee at one of the, the office soccer thing. I'm the, um, so, I, two last questions. Um, so, and now it's the last question I always ask all of our um, speakers. Actually, these two questions I always ask our speakers. But if you could. Rewind 20 years from now, like 20 years ago, I'm sorry. Um, and then, you know, you're in the audience and listening to a badass entrepreneur. What would be the single best piece of advice you would have given yourself? Hire the very best people you can. And, and that's not easy because oftentimes you can't afford them. Uh, so there is that you can, right? Sometimes there are people who are great, but you just can't afford them. But, but hire the very best people you can afford. Surround yourself with the very best people that you can afford. And then the last question, this is probably the most important. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, who is your favorite superhero? <laughs> Or historical figure, because one of our past speaker complaining, he's like, superhero, that's stupid, right? So I was like, okay, slash historical figure. Superhero or slash historical figure, who's your favorite and why? Yeah, so that was a hard one for me. I, 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 d I don't have a superhero that I sort of especially relate to. And, and I, there's so many historical figures, it's really hard to pick one. But I think if I, if I had to pick one that I, sort of resonates with me, um, I am, I just love innovation. I love people who've not just, who are not just creative, but who apply that creativity to solving real problems. That to me is, those are my superheroes. And, I, you know, I'd have to say probably Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Edison? Jefferson. Thomas Edison, sorry. Thomas, Thomas, Th Thomas Edison. Edison. Sorry. Ooh, okay. Because <laughs> sorry. Because <laughs> there, there's there's just repeat guys like, here. They know exactly was, what's coming yeah. up. Um, usually, Thomas what I Edison. Do, I just think his his you know relentless pursuit of innovation and and solving real problems, yep. not just creating ideas, but solving real problems. Yeah. So obviously, you told me this answer, yeah. and um, the reason why we ask is yeah. because, um, <clears throat> so. Uh, oh, thank goodness! I well, didn't no. So my mind. I, uh, I, I, I <laughs> uh, usually what I do is I try to get a speaker gift. Um, I went I, I went to uh, to a bookstore to find it. This took me literally three bookstores. I had, it took me almost three hours to look for this. There's a store behind this. Um, this is you know New York Times bestseller uh, series. Who was Thomas Alva Edison? And I said, hey, I need to get any book about Thomas Edison. <laughs> And they're like, oh, we do have them, but they're in the children's section. So <laughs> Even better. <laughs> so Thomas says, oh, wait, 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 here. And then, hold on, wait, wait, wait. But, and then I saw that. 
next to uh, who is Richard Branson. So, <laughs> there we go. There I like him too. He's ladies a, and, ladies not, and gentlemen. Yet, not yet historical. Got but. it right. <laughs> thank you for but coming out. Hysterical. <laughs> thank you for coming out, Peter. It was nice. Brian, it was thank great. You thank you for much. coming out. Thank you. Thank Sorry. you. Um,